Well, good morning. It is my joy to be with you, praising God together in the sanctuary this morning. As we continue our sermon series called The Gospel According to Jesus, as we journey together through the Gospel of Matthew, looking at Jesus as king, we kicked off with the genealogy of the king and moved ahead to the coronation of the king, that is Jesus' baptism, and he was immediately sent into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. You may know that's what this present season of Lent is based on. We looked ahead to the reign of the king. The sick are healed, the dead are raised, the king has come, Christ Jesus. Last week I was in this room with you when our pastor Jeff took us up to the mountain to look at the glory of the king, Jesus transfigured, and he sent us back into the valley to declare what we had seen and heard in Christ Jesus. And now today we continue with the anointing of the king. We'll be jumping forward quite a bit in Matthew's gospel. We'll be in chapter 26, so you can go ahead and turn there if you would like, Matthew chapter 26. I'll be reading from the New International Version this morning. Today's a great day for you to have your Bibles wide open as we'll be digging in quite a bit. You also do have that handy bulletin you should have picked up on your way in that has room for you to take notes, as well as a QR code you can use to scan a sermon response guide that I hope you'll use this week. There's a new one of those available to you every week. My prayer is that it's a resource for you to be able to really take the time to respond to what God pours into you today, whether you do that in your personal time with God or preferably with close friends and family who can pray for you and encourage you as you do. So we are jumping forward in Matthew. There's some background that would be helpful for you to know in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is constantly on the move as he's journeying toward Jerusalem with his disciples. Along the way, he's teaching his disciples the way, that is, the way of Jesus, the way of discipleship, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, isn't he? And so Jesus has been preaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come near. But he's not just emphasizing the kingdom. He's emphasizing the king. He says something greater is here among us. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus, our king, has come. That's important to notice as we step into today's story. So both in the Gospel of Matthew and in our lives this morning, we're nearing Easter just two Sundays from now. Matthew 26 begins by saying, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So Passover is coming. Many Jews in the area would have traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate this historically significant religious event when God in his grace passed over his children, in homes that were marked by the blood of the Passover lamb. Isn't it interesting that now, in just a matter of days, God in his grace once again would pass over, spare the lives of those who would be called his children, those of us who are marked by the blood of the perfect Passover lamb, Christ Jesus, those of us who trust in him. We no longer need to fear death. We've been given life in his son. That's no accident. So this is where we are in the story when it says Jesus had finished saying all these things. It's saying the public teaching ministry of Jesus has now concluded. We're now stepping into a transition towards the passion narrative. That is the story of Jesus headed towards the cross to suffer and die for us and be raised to life for us so that we might live with him forever. Notice that turn here in chapter 26. So where do we find Jesus? Well, he's arrived in Jerusalem, but in our text today, as we jump in at verse six, Jesus is not in Jerusalem. He's staying in Bethany, a little town outside of Jerusalem. He's gathered with his disciples and some of his closest friends, Mary, Martha, her brother Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead, and they're at Simon's house. Simon had suffered from leprosy and likely been healed by Jesus to now host this meal together. So just a couple of days before Jesus is crucified, where do we find him? Gathered with close friends, living life together. That's our king. So enough about that, let's jump in, shall we? Matthew 26, starting in verse six. 
While Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Perhaps you've heard this story before. If not, you've heard it now with us today. And what Jesus says at the end of this is fulfilled. That wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, don't miss that throughout the world. That's a promise. What she has done will be told in memory of her. And maybe if you're like me, when you hear this story of Mary, I know she's not named in the gospel of Matthew, But we know that this is Mary of Bethany because of John's gospel. John's gospel is the only one that actually names her. I think the reason she's not named in the gospel of Matthew is because this story is not about Mary. It's about Jesus. But if you've heard this story over the years, like me, I most often hear that Mary offers Jesus her best. And that's right. She absolutely does. But also, if you're like me, maybe when you hear that, Rather than being encouraging, it's slightly condemning. Because maybe when you hear that Mary offered Jesus her best, you too imagine something tied up with a bow, pristine and put together. Maybe all you can offer Jesus right now doesn't quite feel like your best. Maybe it feels broken, less than. Before we jump in today, I'd wanted to share that when I was assigned to preach this passage with you today and began studying, I was coming out of a time here in 2022 where I've been Believing a few different lies, most prominent of which has been, I feel like I don't love God enough. Not like I once did, not like I should. Now when I say that out loud before all of you today, I know that's a lie straight from the pit of hell, but it doesn't make it any less believable when it's playing on repeat in my mind. I thought I didn't love God enough. And a few weeks ago on a Friday night, God in his grace met me by his spirit and I felt like he said, The fact that you're so grieved and broken over this is evidence that you do love me. I'm here, I'm not leaving. So I took my broken heart to God and I believe that he was honored in that. He was delighted with it. I gave him all I could. That was my best, but it sure felt like brokenness. I wanna ask you this morning, what if in the hands of God our brokenness is our best. In Mark's gospel, in chapter 14, he tells the same story, and I appreciate the language that he uses. He says, Mary breaks this jar and lets the perfume pour over Jesus. That image of brokenness encourages me today. I hope it does for you too. What if in the hands of God, our brokenness is our best, but also what if in the eyes of God, our brokenness is truly beautiful? Jesus says she's done a beautiful thing to me. In Mark's gospel, Jesus says she's done what she could. She's done what she could. Well, that doesn't quite sound like somebody's best on the surface, does it? But she's given all she can. Be encouraged. Give God what you can today. Give him all you have. Because what if in the eyes of God, your brokenness is truly beautiful? He wants all of you. You are welcome and wanted before him. He wants your worship, but he sure doesn't need it. You see, God doesn't need our worship. It doesn't sustain him or keep him filled as God. He's God. So who needs our worship of God? We do. We do. Because when we worship God as worthy, just as Mary does here, we're reminded of who he is. It keeps us filled and sustained to keep walking by faith. 
and not by sight. God's always delighted in our worship as we are. We look in the Old Testament in the Psalms, you may be familiar in Psalm 51, 17, the psalmist writes, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, O God, will not despise. So before we jump in, I just thought maybe there's somebody else in the room who needs to be encouraged that you are wanted and welcomed before God just as you are. Perhaps in his hands, in his eyes, your brokenness is truly your best and beautiful. Pour out your heart before him. He's worthy. So jumping into this story, when I read what's happening here, I can't help but think that somewhere along the way, the disciples lost sight of Jesus, didn't they? If there's a theme for today's message, it's this, seeing, seeing. So look for that along the way. Somewhere along the way, the disciples have lost sight of Jesus. They've lost sight of what matters. And this story, they're looking a lot more like scribes and Pharisees than disciples. And interestingly enough, Mary is the one who's taking the posture of a disciple. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you look in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus over and over says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. In the NIV, those scribes are referred to as teachers of the law, which is helpful for us in our present context to know who they are and what they do. So in Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. That's what's happening here, isn't it? Mary's entering the kingdom, and the disciples won't have it. As they see her worship of God as far too extravagant and quite unacceptable in their eyes. As she pours out an entire jar of perfume upon Jesus, would have, would have been over a year's worth of wages. The disciples lost sight of Jesus. And you know, they think that they're rightly applying the teaching of Jesus. Because just before here in chapter 26, 25 ends by Jesus being asked three times, when did we see you? And Jesus says, whatever you did to one of the least of these, you did to me. And whatever you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. So it seems that the disciples are in the right, except here's the problem. The disciples were so fixated on the least of these that they lost sight of the one true king. They missed when Jesus said, you did it to me, or you did not do it to me. Notice how Jesus says to Mary in verse 10, or about her, she has done a beautiful thing to me. But the disciples, they think they're right. You see, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus tells a rich young man one day, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Well, way to go, disciples. You're spot on, aren't you? Except... Jesus didn't stop there, did he? Let's look again. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 21. Jesus says to the rich young man, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Then come, follow me. Friends, we are absolutely supposed to care for the poor, to pray for, encourage, give toward, love, and serve the poor. Look at the life of Jesus. He did it. He is our example. He said so. The poor is always going to be among us. But that is not the end-all, be-all of our calling. That is not the primary call on our life. The primary call on our life is come and follow me which should have been familiar to the disciples. Because at the beginning of this gospel, it was at that call from Jesus, come and follow me, that they were willing to leave their nets, their source of income, everything to follow Jesus. He was worthy of it. And yet somewhere along the way, they lost sight of him. They lost sight of not only the call, but the one who called them. 
You see, when Jesus says, come and follow me, it's not a one-time invitation for salvation. It's an ongoing invitation into a relationship with him that transforms us as we worship him as worthy. Come and follow me. Do you hear it this morning? So somewhere along the way, the disciples lost sight of Jesus. But Mary sees Jesus, doesn't she? She sees the sick are healed, the dead are raised, the king has come, and he is worthy of our praise. She's ready to anoint him as king. She takes her perfume and pours the whole thing over him. And if Mary was sassy, she could have defended herself before those disciples. Because just as they thought they were rightly applying the teaching of Jesus, I got to tell you, so was she. If you look with me in Matthew chapter 20, verse 15, in the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Jesus says, from the perspective of the landowner, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Couldn't Mary have also said, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own perfume? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Well, that's just it, isn't it? I don't think the disciples would have been fuming, having a fit, if she had just dabbed a little bit of perfume on Jesus, the proper way to anoint him as king. She poured the whole thing on him. It had to have reeked. Can you imagine? Hope bottle of perfume poured on Jesus over a year's worth of wages. And so the disciples, it says they're indignant. It's a much stronger word than that in Greek. They're infuriated. They're scolding her, chastising her. Why this waste? Mary could have defended herself to those disciples. But she doesn't have to. Look and see our king here, King Jesus. He treats her as he tends to treat women and those who worship in spirit and in truth. As you imagine, she's in this humble posture of worship on the floor, having poured out all she has before Jesus, believing he's worthy of it. And this group of grown men around the table, scolding her, chastising her for an unacceptable act of worship. Jesus intervenes. Because if you notice, not only did the disciples lose sight of Jesus, they don't even see her. If you look in verse 8 in Matthew 26, it says, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. So Jesus says, why are you troubling this woman? Jesus sees Mary, doesn't he? And that word for troubling in Greek is significantly stronger. It's more like beating. So it's more like Jesus said, why are you beating this woman with your words? She's done a beautiful thing to me. Now we can't properly pinpoint precisely why Mary would have poured out all of her perfume upon Jesus on that day, but a good reason may be that Jesus had raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead for four days and Jesus came and revived him. Mary had received the gift of her brother back from the dead. You gotta imagine that she must have been thinking something along the lines of, what can I possibly give Jesus? to show my gratitude for what he has given back to me. As she searches her house and she finds this jar of perfume and she's ready to anoint him as king, to worship him, to show gratitude. And my gosh, I'll just pour the whole thing on him. <laughs> and Jesus says it's a beautiful thing she's done. She's prepared him for burial. Pastor Jeff said um, it was likely that Jesus smelled like this perfume all the way to the cross. But I think it's impossible to rightly interpret what's happening in this story without looking at what immediately follows it in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you'll join me in verse 14 of Matthew 26, we see Judas. Now Judas is one of the 12. He's one of the disciples. He's walked and talked with Jesus, lived his life learning from him. He sat at the table. He saw Mary's extravagant act of worship. He heard his good teacher declare that she's done a beautiful thing. He's worthy of all our worship. And here we see Judas, verse 14. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? 
So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Gets me every time, I hope it does for you too. You know, it's really easy for us to demonize Judas, but he was one of the 12 who lost sight of Jesus somewhere along the way. And in so doing, it's led to his betrayal. As you gotta imagine, Mary was asking, what can I possibly give Jesus to show my gratitude to him for what he's given me? He's worthy of it all. Now Judas says to the chief priests, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? To you. Do you catch that language? I hope you're familiar with it by now. Remember the end of 25, Jesus says, whatever you did to one of the least of these, you did to me. Whatever you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now Judas says to the chief priests, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? Judas, how did you miss it? How did you miss him? The chief priests, they've hated Jesus. They've been looking for an opportunity to kill him and now they've found it in one of his very own. And for what? 30 pieces of silver? That cannot even compare to over a year's worth of wages that Mary just poured out on Jesus and he said he was worthy of it. And sure enough, 30 pieces of silver cannot compare to a seat at the marriage supper of the lamb. Judas, how'd you miss him? What does Judas watch for? Verse 16, he's not watching for the king. He's not watching for the kingdom. It says, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over, to betray him. That's the Greek word there. It's the same word that's been used three times in chapter 26 so far, betrayal. Starting with Jesus as he prophesies what's about to happen to him in verse 2. As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over, betrayed, to be crucified. And now we see that word associated with Judas in 14 and 16. When Judas realizes what he's done, he's filled with sorrow and regret, and he brings these 30 pieces of silver back to these religious leaders, and he throws it on the ground before them. They won't take it. They shame and shun him. So Judas goes to hang himself to die on a cross. Judas, who is at the table, he was one of the disciples who cried out, why this waste? That Greek word for waste is much more significant. It really means ruin or destruction. Why this ruin, why this destruction, Judas had said, and now his betrayal has led to his very own ruin and destruction. Friends, I pray that we hear this word of warning this morning. Somewhere along the way, the disciples lost sight of Jesus. My goodness, if the disciples can lose sight of Jesus, how much more can we? How much more do we? These disciples who saw Jesus walk on water, raise the dead to life, let the deaf hear, the blind see, the mute speak. They saw Jesus face to face. If they can lose sight of Jesus, how much more can we? So how do we live our lives in this posture of a true disciple? It's by doing what Mary shows us here. It's by pouring out all we have to Jesus continually. He's worthy of it all. Looking to him as worthy. We need so much more of him. And we need so much more of one another. This is why we gather together in worship. We remind one another who God really is. To keep our eyes on him. He's worthy of it all. See, somewhere along the way, the disciples lost sight of Jesus. But Mary sees Jesus. And Jesus sees us. Jesus sees us. Do you hear it? Jesus' body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. He gave his whole life as a sacrifice for us that the watching world who doesn't know him would say, what a waste. But not Jesus. 
He sees us as worthy. Jesus poured out his life for us. In his eyes, we are worthy. In his eyes, we've always been worthy of his love. This was not a last minute plan of God. This was his perfect plan from the beginning of time. That while we were living as enemies of God, he called us friends. While we were still sinners, Jesus Christ suffered and died for us, was raised to life for us so that we might live with him forever. Praise be to him. He poured out his life for us because he sees that we're worthy in his eyes. So friends, let us pour out our lives to Jesus. May he forever and always be worthy in our eyes. Because he is. He's worthy of it all. Ten years ago, I was part of a Bible study for young adults that met in a coffee shop in downtown McKinney. And we wrapped up one summer night and I was ready to go, but a big rainstorm came in that prevented me from leaving. And I can still see myself standing on those wooden floors looking out the big picture window and the rains pouring down. And I felt the Holy Spirit convict me of this. It's stayed with me over the last 10 years, and I pray it always does. That I want to live my life in such a way that if the reality of God proves not to be true, my life was a total waste. Here's the hope in that. I can boldly declare before every one of you this morning with my whole heart that Jesus is real, that God is true, he's entirely faithful. Jesus came for us, lived his life for us, suffered and died for us, was raised to life for us, and he's coming back again for us. Therefore, if I live my whole life in such a way that the watching world would call it a waste, a life wasted for Jesus, then Lord willing, when I see him face to face someday, he's going to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because that is what we are, isn't it? Servants of the most high king. May his sacrifice not be wasted on us, would we waste our lives for him? He's worthy, worthy of it all. This weekend, I was talking with a friend of mine. She and her husband are serving the Lord overseas, and I have the joy of supporting them and praying for them and encouraging them. And before I continue with this story, I just want to say they're people just like us. We have a habit in the church of elevating those who serve God around the world as heroes of the faith. But they're people just like us. They have the exact same call as we do. Remember it. Come and follow me. And it just so happens that God has called them to serve on the ends of the earth. But we are all called to reach the ends of the earth. And so these friends of mine used to live in China. They, were, they learned Chinese to be able to partner with God as he's building his church in China. And they loved it, but the door was closed. And so God redirected them. And now they're leading a team and living among a people who are displaced, abandoned, neglected, and shunned. And they're working hard to learn this people's language. You know, they already learned Chinese, and now they're trying to learn one of the hardest languages to learn on the planet. Also that these people would hear the good news of Jesus that I'm proclaiming to you today by his spirit. He's worthy of it. My friend was telling me this weekend that the people that they're serving in their community, you know what they're known as? You know what they're called? The trash people. The trash people. What's a synonym for trash? Garbage? Waste? Do you hear it? Here, my friends are wasting their life serving amongst the waste people. In the name of Jesus, it's not a waste. They're worthy. So my friend was telling me this weekend that she's been reading through the Gospel of Matthew 2, looking at the kingdom of God and how Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a fine pearl, right? When you find it, you sell all you have to go and buy it. And she said this story can be understood from two different perspectives. We tend to look at that pearl as Jesus, that when we find him, we sell all we have to buy him, to belong to him, to follow him. He's worthy of it all. 
But she said the story can also be understood from the perspective that that pearl is us, that Jesus, upon finding us, gives all he has to buy us, to purchase us with his blood, that we would belong to him, that we would be called his children, praise God. She said this love of Jesus is a value-bestowing kind of love, that we love because he first loved us. And isn't it fascinating that here in Matthew 26, Jesus has not yet gone to the cross, but Mary still sees that he's worthy of all she has. She loves him. The love of Jesus is a value-bestowing kind of love, and so these friends of mine clearly are not living the American dream, far from it. But I believe they're living the king's dream as they waste their lives serving amongst the waste people, the trash people, who, let me tell you, are not trash people before God. They are treasured before God, created in his image. God set eternity in their hearts that they might know him and worship him. And one day, Lord willing, they're going to stand side to side with us in heaven before the throne, praising God as Savior and worthy. So I have to ask you, for every one of us as we leave here this morning, how is God leading you to waste your life for him? That one day he might say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Perhaps he's leading some of you in this room to do what my friends are doing, to move somewhere else in the world, to serve among a people who most of which don't know anyone who knows anyone who knows anything about Jesus. Are you willing to go learn their language, share the hope of Christ with them? Dearly loved children of God, perhaps God is calling you. He's worthy, I promise. Perhaps the way that God is calling you to reach the ends of the earth is to do what I'm doing in this season, to send, to support, to pray for and encourage. Jesus says, how can they go unless they're sent? To send is just as important as to go. You can't have one without the other. Would we waste our lives for Jesus sending those to the uttermost parts of the earth? Would we always care more about the Messiah than money? It's his anyway. Or maybe the way that God is leading you to reach the ends of the earth is not to go across the ocean, but it's to go across the highway to our neighbors in Vickery, many of whom have come to us from the uttermost parts of the earth, many of whom are displaced, abandoned, neglected, and shunned. Perhaps God is calling you to go and live your life in victory amongst our neighbors, sharing the hope of Jesus with them and learning from them too. Some way, somehow, God's leading every one of us to waste our lives for him so that one day he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. May his sacrifice not be wasted on us. May we keep our eyes on him. May we pour out our lives to him. He's worthy of it all. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you that by your grace, in a way that I'll never understand, from the very beginning, you saw us as worthy in our brokenness, in our sin. You loved us in a way no one, ever else, no one else ever can. You came for us, suffered and died for us, were raised to life for us, that we might live with you forever. May your sacrifice not be wasted on us, Lord Jesus. I ask by your spirit, you'll show us even now how are you leading us to waste our lives for you so that one day you might say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You're worthy of it all. Show us how we can do that even this week. But may we not lose sight of you and what you're wanting to do with our whole life as an offering to you. Lord Jesus, you're worthy. Forever and always. Amen.